Okay, hello everyone. Today I'm speaking to a very interesting guest. Uh, he's a uh, professor in, in Switzerland uh, about uh, on epistemology, the philosophy of uh, science. Uh, Michel Esfield, uh, welcome. Yes, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me on your program. Yeah. So you recently wrote an interesting uh, piece. Uh, I, I got the origin of the piece is the uh, Liberal Institute, but it was published in uh, numerous uh, publications. It was called The Open Society and Its New Enemies. Um, and in it, uh, you talked a lot about Karl Popper's idea of an open society. And I, I guess I want to start there. What is an open society? Well, very briefly put, an open society is a society that recognizes every person as a person, as a human being, that has a dignity and that has certain fundamental right to participate in the life of the society. And these rights apply unconditionally. That is to say, there is no one that stipulates who can enter into the society and who is banned from the society. Right. And the, would you say that most Western countries are, by and large, open societies? And I guess under that mantle, I include places like South Africa and Namibia, which is you know, not really Western, but democratic societies. Yes, yes. I would say most Western worlds were from, I mean, the United States has a much longer history. But after the Second World War, so Popper wrote this book during the war. And after the Second World War, the Western countries were open societies, and that's what they find them in, in contrast to, 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 to communism. And unfortunately, what we see today is that we are that we are on a road to a closed society because people are now, or some people think that they are entitled to stipulate to state who can be a member of a society and what can be said in society and what must not be said. So you see that that that, that people who who happen to have uh, other views than, than 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 some people who have some power in science and uh, and politics are cancelled. That we even have the the, the word cancel culture, although this is not at all a culture to cancel people. And that's something that is contrary to the open society, because someone takes themselves to be entitled to define what you can say what you can do and what you must not do. And only on that condition, only by applying to the rules that these people, only by complying with the rules that these people set up, are you allowed to enter into society. But of course, see, you see, under communism, if your views um, 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 were in agreement with what the ruling party thought, you had all the freedom you had of expression and whatever. Right. And of course, yeah, you're free to say as long as you toe the party line. And yes. that, that was also true yes. under, under fascism. It was true under nationalism yes. in South Africa. Uh, you yes. got censored. You got censored if you, if, you, if you disagreed with the government or the church or in medieval times. And so, you know, fundamentally in the open society, broadly defined, it cannot exist without, as you say, Grundrechte in, in German or constitutional yes. rights. Yes, yes. It, basic it, human rights, yeah. And these include the freedom of expression. And that is necessary because only by listening to all the views which are voiced with, with, with reason can we make progress. No one knows from the outset whether they are right or not. And you make progress by, by, by listening to other people who may be very different from you and their background, who may hold completely different uh, views from your own views, and, and you enter into conversation with them and you learn something. And be it only that, that your own views are corroborated, because your argument is strengthened by, by, by you being able to refute what, what other people say. But if you silence them, you cannot make any progress anymore because there will be no one that, that, will, that will question the, the, the basics from which you argue and act. Or you will see it once once you fail. So, so today we see failures of certain policies but, but the, it could have been managed in a better way if only they had listened to critics. But there's an interesting herd mentality that comes in. And um, in, your, in your book on the philosophy of science, you gave the idea of a paradigm shift. Um, it was the best explanation I've had of it after Thomas Kuhn's book. Um, why is, you know, uh, I, I think, why is it so that scientists themselves underappreciate the value of the paradigm shift? 
But that because most of them work in a paradigm and they are attached to their paradigm. And then it's the task of the philosophers to think, I think also of other people, but in the first place of philosophers, it's their professional task uh, to think outside the paradigm and to, 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 to question certain assumptions on which paradigms are based. But I mean, Kuhn as a sociologist is, is to a certain extent right. And that's, uh, we witness a certain paradigm shift now in that things that were taken for granted for decades are no longer taken for granted, I mean taken for granted in the sense of, 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 of how we deal with each other and, and that we respect certain basic rights of, of one another. Right. And, you know, the, where I want to take this conversation is during this pandemic, we heard this famous phrase, follow the science. You know, um, every government was following the science, uh, even though they had completely different policies that had absolutely nothing to do with the science, you know. Exactly. It had nothing to do with it. The question is, follow which science? And the issue is, science can tell you how to build an airplane so that you can fly to South Africa without the airplane crashing or how to build an airplane so that you can fly from Europe to the United States uh, without uh, and, and getting there safely. But science cannot tell you what you should do. Science cannot tell you whether it's reasonable for a society to invest in, in airplanes, etc. So science cannot, science can give you knowledge of facts, but it cannot make any normative proclamation cannot tell you you should do this and that so um, and that's you know, a follow the science what does this mean I mean of course you 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 everybody acknowledges the facts although sometimes there are disputes about facts and these days when when, when things get hot then, then then people start disputing basic facts but but if they come back to their minds they would agree on the facts and then the question is so what on the basis of the facts nothing follows for 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 what you should do. And of course, you can give advice, you can have ideas on the, the facts are these and, and these, so we should do that and that. But you see, I mean, in this pandemic, you've seen the facts on the same scale as earlier pandemics, such as the Hong Kong flu, 68, or the Asian flu in the 1950s, okay? And there everybody said, okay, the, 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 the life and society has to go on and then we, we protect and we help them to the extent that it's possible who need help. End of story. And today the reaction this was completely different. So it cannot be the facts or the science. It is yeah. how you evaluate the facts, which norms you accept, which ideas you have, etc. And you defined in, in your piece the term scientism. And you say scientism, or you, you elaborate, scientism is actually the opposite of science. What is scientism? And, and what, how? How scientism is what we, yeah yeah scientism is what we see now the idea that science because it has knowledge of certain fact can tell people and can tell can steer society can tell uh, uh, can like you, you you I mean in physics you 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 know you you can make statistical predictions sometimes deterministic predictions you can prepare the systems in your lab and they behave as you prepare them okay now if the idea you can do the same with people with human beings science has some knowledge about them and now we can steer them uh, on 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 the course uh, that we think fit and and the norms are contingent and they come in from the outside so so these days it was um, um uh, we we stop the outbreak of a virus in society we steer society in such a way that uh, that that we minimize infections with the virus at whatever costs and and uh, whatever human rights people may have or so and that's completely contingent what norm it is other days it was uh, some racial hygiene and eugenics and, and national socialism on yet another day, it was some some sort of social justice in the form of a classless society without exploitation. That's completely contingent. But the idea always is that science somehow has a privileged knowledge for society that entitled scientists to tell other people what they should do or what they have to do. I mean, this is this in Germany. And when, when the people don't do it, they didn't follow the science. When I mean, the people didn't do it, they didn't follow the science, of course. So if lockdowns don't work, there are, there are always some culprits out there that didn't follow the science. You know how it was in, in, in communism, why the economy didn't work. So there were still some fascists left. 
And, and they even had to build a wall in Berlin to prevent the fascists from entering. But nevertheless, some fascists still penetrated. Yes, it's the same, right. it's the same logic. It's never, I mean, you see that something went wrong because you now give up a basic criterion of science, which is that it is an enterprise that corrects itself. Usually you make a certain hypothesis, you collect data, you make experience and experiments, etc., and you check whether your hypothesis is right or not. And if it is not right, you correct it. But, but these so days, it. when you do it in politics, when you make an experiment with the whole society, you cannot say, okay, oh, sorry, the hypothesis that lockdowns may work in fighting a pandemic, it, it was wrong. Sorry about that. I mean, the, what, what, the direction of the people. I mean, it, it's not, you, you we are see, no we, longer... We're dealing with politicians here, and, you know, politicians never want to admit they made a mistake. They will exactly. just, they will maybe say, we won't try it again. That's sort of their way of, of saying we made a mistake. But I've yes. never seen a politician saying, so I'm sorry, I made a mistake, and I'm going to try something else. You know? Yes, exactly. But a scientist usually does that. So you try, I mean, think of, 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 of things at the frontier of, of today's research. Okay. So we have as fundamental physical theories, general relativity and quantum physics, but we don't have a theory of quantum gravity. Now scientists make certain hypotheses, try them out, look where they go. There are different approaches, etc. They argue with each other, but it's not a shame or it's not a, there's nothing wrong with, with formulating a hypothesis, checking it and dropping it because it doesn't work. That's normal science. But when you think that you have moral normative knowledge, that becomes difficult. Yeah, yeah. so better, better not do it. Better. So the issue is that, that when science goes into politics, gives norms, etc., well, you destroy the science itself. You can no longer have the usual scientific means of, of making progress, of, of, of checking claims of knowledge. You get into a political debate, you have seen this, so, so people who criticize uh, uh, what, what, what other people think is the science that should be followed, uh, they are, they are cancelled. They are, yeah. you, 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 don't, you never get an argument, you just, you just get insults. And you, you get fact checkers on, on Facebook nowadays who are, yes, in my view, more yes. dogma checkers than fact checkers, you know. Yes, yes, you got them even. I learned this on, on, on the German, on the state news channel of Germany. So someone wrote me when I quoted the Great Barrington Declaration that apparently I don't watch TV and, and that, that the fact checker of the TV news had already declared that what was in the, already found out that what was in the Great Barrington Declaration is false. So I said, okay, congratulate what, 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 what knowledge they have these days that even, uh, that even for, for the TV news, they can check this. I mean, that censorship. Well, it, we it, had sounds, this also. it sounds to me like it's an infantada at this stage, you know, or it's a medieval council of Nicaea coming back and it's telling you mm -hmm. this is the only book you will read to. And if you dare to, to not toe the party line, you're going to be kicked out of the church. You know, you're going to be burned at the stake. We haven't started burning people yet, but I think we're going in that direction. Yeah, but 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 we had, I mean, we, we had not uh, seen people burned physically, fortunately, but yeah. we've seen otherwise or, or until March 2020 famous scientists being burned intellectually. Yes. So, so think of, of what happened to John Giannidis or, or to the authors of the Great Barrington Declaration. I mean, there are, there are now enough people out there also in the sciences to resist that, but there is the attempt to intellectually burn them and yeah. to associate so so to associate them at least in the in the continental european context if you want to kill someone you associate them with with uh, with extreme white views or so and so there's, so what, there's another what was... view they, they've been throwing around which is the word denier you're a you're yes. a COVID denier you're a climate denier you're a um you know i don't know even know what else denier that's that's it's usually the, the phrase denier. it started with i mean that that if someone says the Holocaust did not happen, they were called a Holocaust denier. Okay. And I mean, and this is mor morally outrageous. I mean, there are certain contexts in which uh, certain views that are factually false are also morally outrageous, at least cross certain limits. Okay. 
So then the, the term Holocaust, Holocaust denier was created for someone who does not acknowledge the, the, the fact of the crime committed by the Nazis. Right. And now you, you, you abuse or you make inflationary use of that term. So you have uh, Corona deniers and, 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 and climate deniers and, uh, and whatever. And, and this is, of course, I mean, all this shows that, that um, those who use these means, they don't have arguments. Right. I mean, and, if but, they but had do, arguments, do they could it, bring forward the argument. Do, do you think it's deliberate on their part in the sense that they want to go out and have hit pieces on people? Or is it just this resistance to the change of paradigm? It is. I mean, to my mind, once you start to use science in a political context to justify certain measures that drastically infringe upon human rights. Now, the idea was that this is justified by science. And if you now have a scientific debate, so one scientist says we should have lockdowns, and another scientist says that we must not have lockdowns, a politician or, or a fact checker of, of a newspaper cannot decide which scientist is right. So you have to pretend that there is no scientific debate going on. Right. And you do this by, by, by saying, well, these are not scientists, these are deniers of science, etc. But that's clear once you go into the one science, uh, um, it's like the church in medieval times. You cannot have dissenters within the church because uh, then the church, I mean, the lay person cannot decide who has the right religious beliefs. So this, yeah. the system works only to the extent that you can say this is science, it's a monolithic block and, and uh, everybody, everybody else, whatever their erstwhile scientific reputation may be, is, an, is a science denier then. Right. And, you know, it's interesting to me how the media itself has now become the propaganda pieces. You know, they're not there to inform and alert the public to quote John F. Kennedy. That was the role of the media. Now it's been yeah. to try and dogmatize the views into the camps of what is acceptable and what isn't. I mean, um, I've seen it on my own channel. I've had the interview of Nick Hudson, who was part of the Declar Great Barrington Declaration, who showed statistics that the lockdowns don't work or they're yes. the alternative that alternative view saying you must protect the vulnerable and let the young decide for themselves, basically, it's more or less. I interview you with uh, people on climate change, like Richard Lindzen, who is an MIT physicist, and he's very skeptical of the thing. He doesn't deny warming. He doesn't deny carbon dioxide, but he denies the extreme interpretations and the predictions of the computer yeah, model. Exactly. Right? You, you deny the predictions. These are models, and what these models predict depends with how what initial values you feed them. And you don't know what you don't know what the exact initial values are. So think of this Ferguson model for, to, to come back not, uh, for this pandemic because this is this is a very clear example now. Now, if you think that that that, why, that people don't adapt their behavior once they get the news that a dangerous virus or a virus that's dangerous for certain people, for certain groups of people circulates, then you predict that this will go on exponentially and then you predict a huge number of deaths depending on, on what the initial value you put for infection, for, uh, for infection mortality rate. But all these are not, 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 not fixed values. So you made the mistake that you don't take into account that you have to deal with human beings and not physical systems and human beings adapt their behavior in a non-predictable way to new information they receive. This is an old argument from Popper and, and Hayek, right. why you cannot ex uh, just uh, apply physical model building to social science. Uh, and you, you, you fix uh, initial values uh, where, where there is a whole range of values. And now if you, if you put the, the infection mortality rate lower as it turned out to be now, then you would get completely different predictions. So you see in these, so, so what is not in dispute is, is the evidence that, what should not be in dispute is the evidence that you have at a certain time. So there's evidence for, for climate change. There's of course evidence for a coronavirus spreading, but the issue is that that you leave the, the basis of, of for what you have firm evidence when you make these predictions, and you have to tell people that you say that if you don't react to this, and if the infection mortality rate is this and this, and if people don't have any 
immunity from 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 previous exposure to viruses of the same type if 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 and if and then 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 you get a huge number of there but but if you change the ifs which you can do with uh, the scientific basis you get the completely different predictions but, but all like, this shows that science is limited this is it's a bad idea to think that you can make predictions and then tell politicians what they should do but you know, I, I ever believed that if Nostradamus lived today, he would have used a computer model. You know, I, I've seen it gone wrong so many times, even in my own work. And I, I've seen business strategists say with the utmost confidence in the world mm -hmm. that in two to three years we're gonna eat the profits. If we eat the profits, they get the bonus. If we don't eat the profits, well, they go on to the next company and they sell the same model again. Mm -hmm. Yes, the economic uh, is, is, is a good example of that because you have so many variables, you have sensitivity to the initial values, so slight differences in the initial values lead to great differences in the outcome, and you have human behavior. Yeah, and you cannot model that, where you can very, very difficult, you can give some confidence, I suppose. But Yeah, usually you, 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 you look at this, um, um, look at the predictions the banks make, or how will, where will the Dow Jones be in a year from now or in two years from now? I mean, no you can check this historically, whether these predictions were accurate, of course. And then people say, well, there came in unforeseen events. Yes, of course, but always unforeseen events always happen. Right. Um, you, in your piece, you, you, you wrote an interesting paragraph where you said that um, people use fear to try and create sort of a market for their own skill sets. And then you have the scientists or the businessmen or the lobbyists becoming more important in society, essentially, um, because of the fear that, you know, they are there to solve the problem that they are creating through the fear. Can you maybe explain that? Yes, I mean, fear was always used by authoritarian regimes, whether they come from, from business people or from politicians or from whomever. How you, how can, if you don't have knowledge and if it's evident that you don't have knowledge about the future, the next best thing you can do is say, well, there will be a great catastrophe come. We will all be extinct if you don't react now. And then people react in a panic manner. That's what we've seen last year. You had some pictures from Wuhan and uh, Bergamo and, and, and then some stories told around these pictures. And, uh, and then you had the panic reaction. And you see this going on to these days. So the other day I saw, and uh, 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 would have to check the source, but, but I think it is reliable. So there was, um, people were asked how, uh, suppose someone is tested positively for, 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 for the coronavirus, what's the probability that they'll have to go to hospital? I mean, the real probability is, is about 5%, but not more right. than 5%. But in the United States, uh, people who voted for Democrats believe that it's 40%, and the, Repu the voted for the Republican voters believe that it's 26%. So the overall population, it's they believe that's 44%. The, 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 the probability that you end up in hospital seven times higher than it was actually. How can that happen? How can have people such false beliefs? Well, because they are, you show them pictures, how dangerous this virus is, etc. And each of these pictures and each of these stories may be right. So, of course, people die from that. But the overall impression you create, give is that there is something very serious, very dangerous coming. And then you check with the actual evidence and you see that the, 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 the beliefs of people are widely wrong. So that's, I think, it's, the, it's a very good argument to say that that something went wrong in the, in the media coverage of, of, of all these things. So it's not that individual stories are wrong or that journalists have e evil intentions, etc., but, but that the overall picture that is communicated to the public is wrong because otherwise how can people have this idea? I mean, they don't but, see the, they don't see their neighbors dropping dead from Corona in, in a massive way. So, so, and you get it. So, so I live in Switzerland, but I'm of German origin. So, in Switzerland, is is not as strict, by far not as strict, in lockdowns as Germany. So sometimes you find then in German media horror stories about Switzerland, and people email me or call me and tell me, oh. Oh, oh did, did, are you still alive? What's this? Are the dead corpses? Are there? I heard that they are lying around here in the streets. I said, okay, come here, look, look around. There are no dead corpses. It's just the, the media coverage. So someone may have died somewhere and, and they may have died from, from Corona or whatever, but it is not, 
statistically significant. So well, you, you see, you, you that, saw that, this. And, um, people didn't read a lot of history as well because of this. I mean, we had a swine flu pandemic in 2009, and I remember it very well because there was my sister was playing hockey at the time, and people were wearing masks even in Pretoria and South Africa. But in a even in the media wasn't as, as widespread. But the other one they never look at is the HIV and AIDS pandemic um, in Africa. So yeah. if you would remember 10, 20 years ago, there was a prediction in South Africa that by the year 2000, black South Africans will be a minority in the country because of AIDS, because there was just a yeah. model predicting end of times. And what they didn't pick up at the time is um, as Nelson Mandela became president, he launched a campaign to register a lot of deaths because in the apartheid years, a lot of people in villages as deaths just weren't registered. So there was a peak in deaths in the country because yeah. we changed the measurement system, right? Yeah. And of course, everyone said this has to be HIV and AIDS, so we have to throw money at the problem. And then all countries started with a campaign to try and teach people about safe sex and, you know, God knows what. And, you know, it's even questionable today if the pandemic was as serious as the media made it out to be. You know, not underplying, undermining anything that happened. Um, most African countries didn't even have statistics at that time. So they took a few statistics here and there yeah. and they ran away with it. So you find when this COVID thing uh, um, hit, a lot of people back home had a little bit more, I think, of a historical background as to how pandemics can can be exaggerated. But unfortunately, I find in Europe, um, the Europeans haven't dealt with diseases before in a, in a very long time. And because of this, it's sort of as if they've got goldfish memories, you know, because... It, yeah, that's, that's true because it's 50 years back. But think of this mad cow disease. When was this? Around the turn of the century, wasn't it? Yeah. That the prediction was that those, those who, who ate beef, uh, they would all be dead And uh, by now, yes? So by now, we would, they would all have been dead because of mad cow disease. And, and this is not... The only case, it is true that we didn't have a pandemic in, in Europe for about 50 years, but it is also true that we have many cases like this mad cow disease or, or AIDS or whatever, at swine flu, where predictions were made that were completely um, um, exaggerated. And swine flu the, by the same people as today. <laughs> exactly, by the same people. And, and so this were contingent circumstances that this time they... they yeah. Their voices were heard, and, and their their suggestions, their recommendations followed. But the serious thing about this is, if you're not cautious, I mean, someday we may have a pandemic which is uh, which is really dangerous, which may have, say, an infection a mortality rate of ten percent or so. Who will believe this after after this story? Once you get, uh, once you will see all the truths about the the coronavirus, uh, you will see it will be evident that the damages caused by the lockdowns are, are much greater than the damages caused by the pandemic in itself. And you get, I mean, will you take seriously the next time there's a virus, but you'd say, oh God, no, not again lockdown, no, don't come again with these stories. And then it may very well be serious. So the, the, the problem is that this time, you know, of course, it is serious and that it is a serious danger for people over 70 with certain uh, diseases, etc. So they really have to pay attention. Uh, John Giannidis' latest estimation is, I think, a, a mortality rate of, uh, of zero up uh, one five percent. So so it's it's, it's like um, 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 people. 15 and 10,000 or so, that's that's not significant. Now he may be, I mean, this may, this went all the time down, perhaps it's went too much down, so it may go up again, but it's below a half percent in any well, the, case. The, the interesting so, thing to me is they, they didn't look at the data which was available. Um, I think Johnny and Edith did. I mean, we had a diamond princess ship, we had a shoulder yes. aircraft carrier, full population test that gave us you know the the shoulder goal, the 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 princess ship had old people on the shoulder goal, had young people on, and surprisingly, from that we could have at least intuitively known from the beginning um, that uh, this virus yes, and that's the what, sort of population better. But we didn't do that, right? We, but John we, Lee said it from the beginning. Yeah. I mean, he was this was just taken seriously, but that was the evidence we had at that time. Uh, in March, uh, early March uh, 2020. And that evidence, I looked at that as well because I wanted to estimate is there a real danger for me or, or for my family? And then do we have to do anything? Then I realized, okay, if that's the data, then it's dangerous for, for elderly people. 
and I have to pay attention and my social interactions with, with them because I don't want to uh, uh, spread the virus unconsciously. So they have to pay attention that I have to ask them and we have to make certain provisions. But that's it. And it's not a danger to the population as a whole. And, and then also the question is how long until we accept a certain amount of deaths? Because I don't even think we've had that conversation yet. You know, any virus mm -hmm. that becomes endemic in flu kills, I think in, in South Africa, it's something like 20,000 people every year. And, you know, COVID's a little bit higher last year. But, you know, with any virus, you have to have an acceptable yes. death rate. You know, yes, same with driving a car. I mean, unfortunately, that happens, and we, we we all have to die one day. And we, I mean, we have to pay attention, but we have to estimate certain risks. So when you drive a car, you you, you there's a certain risk. I mean, you are safer on an airplane, but but uh, but uh, suppose you you drive, uh, say, fifty miles. So one comparison was fifty miles every day. That's the same risk, and we accept the risk. On Switzerland, there are Alps. So, so, so I had a student. They, they, he was doing a, 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 a master project on risk assessment and on albinism. Well, and 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 he died in the sport recently. It was a sad story, but but he was conscious of the risk. Right. He randy said, "Okay, it's worse. I want to do that." I said, are yeah. you sure? You showed me pictures. What you were saying? Are you sure that this is a that this is a good idea? And I mean, it was not a good idea. But of course, you have to respect that 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 that, that people have risk profiles um, um, that are different, and and they they value different things in life. And you intervene, of course, if if my my children were, were with one is teenager and now if they do silly things, you'd say, well, well, you're not, I mean, you have to develop your reason and, and as long as we are responsible for you, 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 you have to respect certain rules. But when they are grown up, it's their life. Yeah, but there is a culture growing, you know, it's, it's, it's partially because we haven't experienced war and, and, and diseases for a long time of uh, trying to eliminate every risk in society. Yes. And, you know, as a cause of that, you don't get to live your own life. You know, um, you, you talk about the mountain. I lost my sister in a, a flash flood a few years yeah. ago. You know, it's sad, but it, it happens as part of life, you know, and where to strike this balance. Yes. <laughs> and that's that's right. I mean, we become a, a society that tries to avert risks uh, at any cost. And the silly thing is that, of course, you create much greater damage with that. So if you think you have to eliminate the risk of infection with the coronavirus, you create so much more damage in the end that in the end of the day, you 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 have destroyed the basis for your livelihood. Right. Uh, so, so I, I want to now talk about the uh, the opportunism. You know, of every virus or any threat, any war, there's always people making money out of it. You know, um, and here is an interesting guy, your fellow Swiss countryman, Mr. Klaus Schwab, who uh, somewhere during the pandemic last year, I mean, you couldn't make a better James Bond villain uh, than this guy, announced yeah. to the world he's going to reset the great the world economy. You know, who is Klaus Schwab? I didn't know of him beforehand, and what yeah, gives him the right? Uh, He's the person who created this World Economic Forum and who had for decades an argument with, with Friedman who said that, I mean, um, um, enterprises should should uh, should make money if I cut this short. I mean, the idea, the, the, the Friedman idea is that the, that the market will decide the issues. So you have an idea, you create an enterprise, uh, and then if other people find your idea great, then you help them and, and improve their life, and then you will make money out of it. And, and there are, of course, certain rules, but these rules are given by the law, and there are, there are certain basic rules, but it is not that that as an enterprise you have any normative privilege and should uh, should I mean the stakeholder concept is very vague so should take in all the stakeholders and 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 then take moral decisions and and so this was I mean Schwab had an argument with with, with Milton Friedman or over decades about that and, and of course don't let an opportunity go so so the coronavirus then then sets the stage for for this um, um, Great reset, which is in in some sort of uh, uh, like a, I mean, a centrally controlled economy, and it doesn't have to be controlled by a by a government. It can also be a big enterprises uh, who uh, can who control this. And again, the the hubris, the 
the misguided idea is that that uh, some group of people call them stakeholders, call them management or call them or whatever you want to like, have some sort of privileged knowledge how to steer society and the economy instead of just let the things go and let the let let it let the individual people decide what what they value for their life and what they don't value and have a frame which 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 sets a basic rule which tells you how to deal with negative externalities so so no one is entitled to pollute the environment uh, for for short term profit etc that's uh, that's all clear but this does not imply that you have a, a, a central plan a plan how to do it and you can sell it under whatever word so so the 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 the, 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 the word now is ESG and and uh, that's environmental that it should be sustainable etc and then you bring in some nice further social elements as if they had the knowledge how to how to control this we will all suffer from this because this will all make us poorer the more you you think you can steer society and the economy the less um, innovation you will have but you know he talks of... about the fourth industrial revolution i want to take him if i have the opportunity to some places in africa that hasn't entered the second industrial revolution yeah. yet you know and it's it's just like it, it blew my mind you know last year like this guy is the great reset i mean it's clear opportunism um but you know he, 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 they talk as if they are the self-elected the self-anointed exactly. of society you know and then the billionaires you know you couldn't get more hubristic where billionaires tell you you're gonna own nothing and be happy yes yes and 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 they think that they have some sort of privileged knowledge and they don't and they are not entitled to make any political decisions yeah we didn't vote for them as, as far yes. as i could remember yes yes so um i guess i want to ask you another question here and this is sort of on the same tone um where you say that people think they have control they have knowledge of a society but actually they don't and you, you drew a parallel between the CO2 emissions in uh, Germany and the United States um, in your article. Yes, you yes. Pretty much the same thing happened, but Germany, yes. Germany embarked on adventurism and the US went on profit. <laughs> Yes, yes. I mean, the, 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 the Germany tried to plan this, and of course, they they they, they went out of uh, nuclear energy, and uh, and this is of course not a good idea if you want to reduce CO2 uh, um, emissions. But you, it's an example that central state planning doesn't work. I mean, they spend hundreds of of billions of euros uh, on that, and the effect after twenty years is zero. Because, of course, a technology innovates, the United States have, have found natural gas, etc. And, and if you let things go, they will find solutions. Right. So it's, it's yeah. just let people figure it out themselves. Because, I mean, I think it was Hayek who said something, and probably Popper as well, on the lines of, um, you know, engineers in particular are trying to solve problems that are solving themselves, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 I mean it, the issue is the social engineers who think that they and and in Germany you you have this 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 moral tune that they are on the on the side of the morally good people even if they don't achieve anything apart from raising money but but they are morally good and if you if you criticize them or just ask questions you are morally bad. I yes. mean, it's if you ask, why do you shut down all these nuclear power power plants? They don't pollute the environment. Then you say, well, it's it's true that it's immoral to run them. Well, why is it immoral? What's the reason there? It it's it's it. devil's uh, thing. So so this is just. I mean, you see, there's a certain leftist uh, agenda, and they pick up topics. So so in the in the eighties and at the end of the seventies, it started. They picked up nuclear energy and and thought that this was a bad thing. And, and I but mean, you, for you no can, reason. But you see, activists always do something yeah. like this. You know, it's it's the environmentalists is one group of activists. You had the healthcare HIV AIDS activists in South Africa. And, you know, always you can see these people making money out of good causes, you know. Um, it's, it's sort of like a semi-religion being made. Yeah, some people make money out of that. Most of the followers don't make money out of it. And and a lot of people have genuine convictions. So, and of course, some make money, but but they should be open-minded and and argue for their convictions and be open to, 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 to criticism instead of, instead of thinking that they are in a morally privileged position. 
right. which which will backfire in a bad manner. I mean, if you if you do this energy transition, the the, the, the costs will be huge. And and I mean, you know about Africa, etc. So if you would deprive them of energy, which which is the result. So, I mean, how many people will, will die as a well, result of that? I mean, 40% of people in Africa still use wood essentially to cook. So they mm -hmm. die of smog and they've got 30 years shorter lives. And my argument has yeah. been to people, if we burn coal, first of all, we stop the forest from cutting down. And the second thing is we get people out of poverty. So, you know, there's a trade-off yeah. to be made. And sure, yeah. if it's a solar and wind panel, I'm all for it. But the idea to deprive people of energy, which is what the World Bank and the IMF is now doing, it's, yes. it's just it's just morally uh, unconscionable. It's morally abominable. And you see that when you let them make, I mean, they will make technological progress. If they move out of poverty, it's a, it's a natural way that, that technological progress will be environmentally friendly. That's what we have seen. I mean, if you look at, at economically free states and if you look at, at the pollution under communist regimes, the result is clear. There's a clear correlation between, I mean, political freedom in the state, democracy, uh, economic freedom and uh, property rights and environmental protection. It's only that these people don't want to see it. They are obsessed by the idea that it has to be somehow centrally planned. No, the evidence suggests just the contrary. Yeah, but, you know, then it means they have to actually do something else, which is he's got all these committee meetings and, and, and wise ideas and package yes. the paper being pushed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They should do something for in favor of the environment. You know, we have these, these you know, these, these green politicians and they go on, on airplanes and I heard one prominent of them saying, yeah, his work for the environment is, I mean, there was the option, you take a train and the train takes two or three hours to say to get you from Frankfurt to Brussels, for instance, yeah, yeah. takes you three hours these days. And um, um, they go on a plane, yes, because they cannot lose time for their environmental uh, commitments. This, this justifies, I mean, no communist had a problem with, with the communist elite being very rich, of course. The, the, the state of their, their consciousness justifies that they be rich and the other ones be poor. So yeah, how is this in an over its animal form? All animals are equal and some animals are more equal than others because they have the right moral consciousness. Indeed. And that's, uh, yeah, we don't have to comment on that any further. Yeah. <laughs> no, but you see, it, you see it with lots of causes. I mean, environmentalism is just stronger in Europe and North America, but we, we have our own uh, prophets of doom. I mean, and, and there's a serious, I mean, don't misunderstand this. There's a serious problem uh, behind yeah. all this. And I mean, there are serious things uh, going on with, with pollution, etc. And we have to cope with them. And the dispute is about what is the best strategy. And then I would say, look at the historical evidence, what, what, what worked, and central planning never worked. But the problem is serious. That's, that's not, I mean, I'm not, um, uh, how no, it's was not, it's, this, it's, these deniers? I'm not a climate or environment denier. No, but I, I, the point is, you know, there's hypocrisy in the movements. In your article, yes. you, you also wrote about um, you, yeah. this certificate that people now are now using to yes. buy indulgences, the vaccine passport, the social, what's it, SGE uh, statement of the government, of, the, of companies. I mean, maybe go into that, you know, what is wrong with... Um, trying to prove yeah, that, that we come back to the to the beginning of the conversation it's about the open and closed society so of course there's nothing wrong with vaccinations and and you i mean it's a good thing that there are vaccines uh, against also against uh, covid and against many other diseases but it's an individual decision so you make um, um uh, you, you, you look at your risk of, uh, of, the, of the disease and uh, you may have some, some background assumptions. So some people may, may be more open to invasions via vaccines. Other may be more, more cautious about this. This is, of course, completely all right. And that it's good that they are an offer and they should be offered to everybody as far as, as possible. But the issue is that you say now you have to prove that you don't infect anybody else. Although there is no significant danger, you have to prove that your behavior is sustainable. So you can get sustainable certificates, you get some sort of a social pass. And the dangerous thing about that is that some elite now defines or puts condition under which you can ex exercise your basic rights. 
So it's not that you as a person have some basic rights and if someone wants to infringe upon them, they have to prove that, 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 that what you do is dangerous or creates a negative externality or infringes upon the freedom of others in a concrete case so that they have to prove it. No, it's the other way around. You have to, you are on a general suspicion now that you that you spread why that your body spreads viruses that you harm the environment and and uh, that you say things that are that are that are morally not not clean so and then you get the certificate that that, that states that under these are these conditions um, um you can go shopping you can go to a restaurant or to a theater you can you can drive a car under these conditions you can go by car under those not and these are the things that you may say uh, or you may not say so you you tie basically right, that's the closed society someone admits you to society on conditions they fix and tell you now you have to certify this as in, and in the earlier days you had to certify that you are a good catholic or, and the church certifies that or that you that you have um, the The, that you have been baptized, etc., and then you're a morally clean person. Then we can can make contracts with you and deal with you, and otherwise not. And that's the that's the dangerous thing because, of course, this is completely arbitrary. You could do this with with, with anything. And and the basis again, as as we talked as, about this at the beginning, is that each person has uh, to start with their rights. And if you want to limit these rights, you have the burden of proof is on your side or the sides of those who limit it. And these days it looks as if out of an act of grace, governments grant you certain rights if you comply with their instructions. And the instruction these days is to is to become vaccinated. And this is a, I mean, the thing is you set up an example that you can, a paradigm case that you can repeat at will. That's the dangerous thing. If you make through through fear and 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 through um, um, uh, information that you spread and which is not quite uh, correct as far as the the, the the statistical data, uh, you make people comply. Or many people I know, many people who say, well, of course this is all mad, but I want to travel, so I get vaccinated of, or, and, and I get this passport so that I can do what I want. And that's a dangerous thing if you comply with that, because the next time you will comply again, and then they right. can do anything with you. And then we end up in China. Now, like like China, there's a, a philosopher, he's not so much known in the English context, Peter Sloterdijk, he's a German person, mm. and, and he's an, a German intellectual. And he said, or German and French, he's fluent in French as well. He said in middle March in an interview with a, with a French paper, Le Point, he said that, that the West will turn out to be as authoritarian as China. And I thought, oh, come on, you're exaggerating. Um, 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 what's that now? Come on, they, it's a panic reaction. They make a lockdown for a couple of weeks, but after a couple of weeks, they will come back to their senses and, and see how senseless no. this is. And now, after a year, I say, yeah, he was right. Yeah, We are on the way uh, into a closed society of becoming as authoritarian as China. And, and, we and don't have the concentration camps as yet, but we are close there. So, so some people in Argentina, for instance, I heard in the northern province of, uh, of Argentina, they were put into concentration camps when they were tested positively and, or quarantine camps and things like that. So, and, so, so there's not much, uh, I mean, we are close there. But it's as if people have got no concept of history. I mean, the, uh, you, you go to the vaccine passports, for example. Um, you know, the apartheid regime had passports for black people if they wanted to walk in the city and they had to show mm -hmm. their name. And of course, the system got abused at the end because it was so ridiculous that people had to be out or um, they had to come from a certain tribe if they want to work in a certain area. So they just yes. changed their surname and nobody cared. And I, I sort of hope this is going to happen, that... Um, I don't see the governments backtracking, but I see that people will break the system just out of non-compliance or civil disobedience. Hopefully, hopefully, but but I'm not so sure. So so, I mean, the, 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 I'm more confident about the United States. Uh, um, they will in Europe. But uh, we had this history. I mean, people well, should. It'll know. be interesting to see in South Africa because it's against our constitution. It's uh, yeah. yeah, and our Supreme Court justice ruled this out. He was going furious. Yeah, it's good. It's good. I mean, 
if you look at the German Supreme Court, they completely comply. They lost yeah. their, 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 their judicative function. Okay. So I heard the president of the court say, well, of course, your, your, your human rights exist. They are just temporarily suspended. And the then I said, it? oh, God, that's good news. I, I worried about this monetary policy, this money printing. But of course, yes, of course, the gold standard is only temporarily suspended by Nixon and one was that at 72, but it was only temporarily suspended. So of course, what, what, what would you worry about? We still live under the regime of the gold standard, don't we? It's just temporarily suspended. So and you have your human rights, they are just temporarily suspended. You know how this, 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 this Nazi regime came about in Germany in a completely, I mean, to the latter legal way. They just had certain uh, laws that entitled the government to do on exceptional situations, certain things such as, I mean, these yeah, laws yeah, about yeah. races, et cetera. But, but this was just, I mean, these, these were, I, I believe the communists, the, the shopkeepers just put the sign up, work, workers of the world unite, you know, something of the sort. And before yeah. you knew it, all the workers were united and then they came from the shopkeepers, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 so I mean, that's, that's, I mean, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall is, is some 30 years behind us now. But that's not, I mean, that's not 300 years back. It's, it's still on the memory of the people. So it is this, this, this spreading of fear together with with interest but 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 very different interest of very different groups who jump uh, on the train plus this I, I, I mean this 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 risk aversion or say increasing in Europe at least of the welfare state which suggests that they can handle all the problems that may come up in life and now a virus comes and and then the attitude is now let them handle that. And of course, that certain politicians got very popular by by uh, showing that they were able to do it and to handle it. I mean, you will see the consequences in a few years, and and then well, they will be gone by by that time. So this popularity will not last. But there are different interests, and 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 yeah, you're oblivious of of, of history and of of say so so basic. Uh, intuitions you don't tell people you don't tell old people that they must not see their grandchildren or things like that yeah. that's a, yeah i mean how, how who are you that you can tell them that they must not see their that, that, that who are you that you tell them what social context other people may have or not i mean i complain if they are loud here if, if they are if they have parties or so and and my, we have uh, i mean then sometimes you say well 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 come on we don't have any we don't have any objection to you talking you said well but 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 loud music at midnight that that has does it has to that's not necessary so but i would never have the idea to tell about oh oh look you you cannot receive 10 people in your apartment or so that's not my job and, and how how can you have the idea to tell people which which context they may have or whether they may leave their house or not that's that's well, completely outrageous well the the interesting thing i saw in, in france is um i think the french people have broken every single rule already but they think everyone else is still obeying the rules you know it's, it's very interesting to see some of my colleagues at work saying okay i just went out during lockdown i didn't yeah. tell anyone and then the other guy comes, I went out during lockdown, I didn't tell anyone. So everyone has been doing it, but nobody's telling each other they're doing it. And it's yes, a weird because world where we're thinking everyone's that's, complying. That's, that's, the, that's the point about the, the system. You don't know who thinks or, or you take a certain risk if you tell someone else that you think that all this is, is, is crazy and that we should not comply. Because if the majority came out and say, stop, we don't comply, it would be finished. So if all the restaurant owners, I mean, in, in, in Germany and in Switzerland, the restaurant in Switzerland, they are half open, Germany, they are still shut down, et cetera. If they said, okay, we open now, yeah, and then people would go into the restaurant. You can, if, if five restaurants do this, you can send in the police or the military. But if they, if the majority of them does it, yeah, it's it's finished. I mean, it's all an issue about compliance and about coordination. How can you know who are which, who else uh, has the same views at you uh, as you have? And and when this and and usually this happens then at a certain. There's a certain turning point when 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 people no longer comply and then it goes very rapidly and 
and it's the end of the thing but, but i'm not sure i mean we are not yet there yeah um i want to ask you on corporations you know in, in your piece um, you highlighted that corporations can be just as authoritarian as yes. central governments right and uh, you know what what is their role in all of this you saw facebook with the censorship that was the more obvious but now you see the big pharma comp companies obviously not want to stop this money train going towards them to you know fight the virus how, how should we yes, respond to it I, yes but of course the the business interests are clear there and and with facebook they 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 they, they need publicity they need they need uh, money uh, coming in etc so so they comply it's more that that i mean my objection more is to this idea or, or what i fear is that a new trend comes up in which a closed society is acceptable so the open society was accepted by by say in the west as say uh, at least three-fourths of the population whether you were a liberal or a classical liberal a libertarian or a person a, a socialist so so the democratic socialist parties they wanted to have a welfare state but they all accepted the basic rules of the open society the same with the conservatives they wanted to have more police and and were in favor of more of tighter security laws etc no problem on spying on people to find out if, if they have some terrorist intentions etc but basically they accepted the frame of everybody having human rights and now a trend develops where this is no longer accepted and of course you can have private companies issuing a, a vaccine certificates and, and and competing for 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 social passes etc so this is this this class schwab thing again that the trend forms and and uh, they jump on it and it does not have to be centrally planned by a government so you don't need an evil government so so some uh, authoritarian guy like 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 Stalin or or, or Mao Zedong or, or or Hitler or whatever coming up and and doing this from above if this becomes accepted among people that you that you somehow have to have to have a, a, a passport that shows that you are that you are entitled to exercise basic rights it doesn't matter whether, whether it's a state whether it's a company etc there are also companies who more or less force their employers to get vaccinated uh, uh, against corona whether it makes sense or not and i would say that's a private affair i mean yeah. unless there is some some specific situations where where certain organizations can fix rules for 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 entering when i apply for a job i don't tell them about my 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 health status i don't show them what, what vaccinations i have or not and if someone asks me in a job interview are you vaccinated against this they would say well well come on stop that's not your business but you can you ask see, me whether i'm competent in this or that area but you have no i have a right to privacy and but that's again against, uh, I'm not sure about European law, but that's at least in South Africa against the law, you know, which we tend to forget here that um, at least in terms of HIV and AIDS in South Africa, no employer is allowed to ask people of their status. Yeah. Um, of yes. course, employers can pick it up if they look at the leave and the HR. You know, some I know some people can pick up trends. It's it's you know you can you can obviously figure it out. But generally, the principle is that discrimination on the basis of your health is not allowed if you're disabled. Exactly. You're not allowed to That's do it. Also, the general. I'm not sure about the, the laws which have been passed now. To what extent they allow this? Because these are laws of of. Uh, exception so they say there's an emergency etc and and this then uh, allows us to to limit this but usually that should be a reaction that you say well well i'm not uh, i'm not inclined to tell you because these are my personal decisions and and they are not 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 pertinent so so if i go to a restaurant i don't show show a vaccination passport i mean that's that's i mean People should say that, that that's completely crazy. And the point, I think I made this also in the paper behind there, is that you now define negative externalities in a completely um, 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 arbitrary way as if everybody just by their existence because they are a human body and they are viruses etc and bodies can spread viruses become a danger to 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 to, to anyone else but i could do the same and you notice from 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 south africa I could say on the basis of, of race discriminations people yeah. from certain races they are a danger to other ones or i could say here now now i'm i'm, I'm uh, because there have been some islam islamist terrorist attacks muslims are a danger to say it's completely married it's not 
it's not based. I mean, you can say this only if you have some statistical evidence and then, but, but there is no statistical evidence. And what people don't see is that if you allow this in this Corona case without any, any reliable, any firm basis of evidence, you can use this for whatever you want. You can yeah. use this also against certain groups of people. You can use this against Jews. If time comes, you just need some story, some panic, and, uh, and, and the story may be true, but it is not statistically significant, etc. And that's a very <clears throat> distressing um, perspective if this becomes accepted, because it can be used on, on many more occasions. And that's why I think it's important to say, well, hey, we are, we are living in an, we should be living in an open society. This is based on human rights. And this is what gave us, I mean, this is what gave us our prosperity. It is not just that, that some intellectuals that, 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 that they enjoy, want to enjoy freedom of speech or something. It's about the prosperity of everybody. I mean, you okay. know that that societies which are free, they they you see this. So so you have a much longer life expectancy. You have a, you have if you're in a, in a free market, you have much better job perspectives. You have much better perspectives for sal salaries. And and the, the reason is that they are trade unions. So no one can fix this from above. If you think that you are treated badly by by an employer, then change the employer or go to, uh, go to a trade union. Unite with other people people who think as well, and then you will make change your employer their mind. And if you let this go on in a, in a, in a free society, you will get the good solutions. And you exactly. see this, I mean, you see the correlation. So it's not just about some, it's not just an intellectual affair, it's about the livelihood of, uh, of people, so they should care. Indeed. And um, what should our response then be? I mean, you touched a little bit on this. You know, we are the public. We are middle class people. Lots of people are saying, um, I'm tired of COVID. I, I mean, this is really where yeah. I am at this stage. I, yes. you know, I, I, I've looked at the statistics to the extent that I understand it. Um, it does not look dangerous to me. It's not dangerous to my father that has had a you know, heart operation, to be honest. You know, he's, he's even survived it. Um, so, you know, you look, you look at this stuff and you're saying, okay, guys, the threat is exaggerated from the beginning. We don't believe your story anymore. And yet the media and the government continues, continues with the narrative. Like, how do we break loose from this and get back to what we used to call normality? Yes, I mean, by, by people listening to such podcasts as we did now. Yeah, I mean, the only thing we can do is to try to, to communicate to the public and hope that that enough people will wake up and uh, and uh, make their voices heard and that's what happened i mean at the beginning you could suppress single voices but in science you have now many people who who, who bring in the evidence you see mm -hmm. in the and the public you see it in in, in, in politics and in Europe, for the first lockdown, you had quasi unanimity among the different parties. Now you see that the, the, the number of parties um, 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 don't support. Their, I mean, parties in the opposition don't support their governments uh, anymore, etc. So, so, so slowly, this is coming back. And the issue is going back to, to, to the normality of the open society. And this case is not gained. I mean, this, 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 these lockdown issues will be behind us and no one will come back with the idea of, of making lockdowns, but they can come back with the idea under the pretext of, of climate protection or, or whatever. They can try the next thing. So it's, it's, it's important to, to, and, to reveal the mechanism behind it. And, what's, and also, uh, what I, I want to add. Is. On, on the climate, you know, um, I mean, we've, we are going to be flooded with propaganda. I'm convinced this year because it's the IPCC report coming out in Glasgow in September, I think. And, you know, there is dissent on the climate debate. That's all I can say. I, I can say I can recommend Stephen Coonan's book with Barack mm -hmm. Obama, Secretary of Energy, wrote a very good book. I'm halfway through it right now. We, you know, he argues that this thing is blown out of proportion. Okay, I am not denying warming or anything of the sort. Yes. Some people make up themselves, but the point he makes is, if you look at the claims being made, especially by the media and the, and the actual science by the people working in the field, it's in completely two different worlds. Yes. And yes. you know, you want to get the message out that seriously, like uh, we cannot throw all our resources to cutting our emissions either. You know, it's, it's just not going to happen. That's it. That's it. You have to do. As always, a check on 
what is the evidence for the dangers that we have, and we have scarcity of resources. What's the best way to allocate the resources? And we have a lot of problems. We have problems of, of poverty. We have also have a lot of environmental problems. So, right. so people die. I mean, people don't be up to now. People do not die of climate change, but they die of of actual cases uh, of concrete uh, cases of pollution. of pollution. And you cannot just. It's like in this this thing as if uh, the coronavirus were the only health problem that we had. Now people died of, uh, and and uh, I heard this from from many people. Now all these fitness studios are shut down. A neighbor here, they had a heart attack because that the, the man worked a lot. He was 62, and and he worked. Uh, he walked uh, three times a week. He got to the fitness studio. He had some some problems with his leg, etc. All this was closed down, and I don't know whether there's a causal connection. But but he could not exercise anymore, so he's, he was working day, day and night, and then he dropped dead from a heart attack. Wow. And, and and know of a, a number of people who say they they have now have health issues because all the usual treatments they have they are suspended. Right. And then they get, of course, health problems. And seriously, so the heart attacks are not treated. People uh, don't go to their cancer treatments or to the to, to, to the screens they should have to detect cancer in, in an early stage. Also, we will see more cancer deaths next, uh, in the next years, etc. So it's not the only issue. You you have to balance this. You have you have a number of serious problems, and and you cannot allocate res all the resources to just one of them. Exactly. And, and, you know, for me, it's also a point that people are, you know, young people are dead scared. People who are not at risk are dead scared of this virus, right? And it's it's like they're not living their life. And I, I yeah. think they will have some regret, you know, in some years' time that they did not do the things they wanted to yes, do. Yes, you can scared. do this. I mean, you see if the, the path of economic growth, the path of fight against poverty is interrupted you will see statistically the years of life lost right. so each of these kids and use their their life expectancy statistic life expectancy goes down which does not say that in the individual cases uh, you, you, you cannot make individual predictions on the, on this basis but you have statistical evidence all the time when you had an economic shutdown for whatever reason life expectancy went down and there were many years of life lost mm -hmm. and then you can make calculation compare what could have supposing that lockdowns were how many years of life could have been gained and compare this and the result is sobering. Well, I mean, the, the stats I've seen in France and South Africa suggest to me that lockdown at best, that very close to nothing. Um, yes, in terms of yes we have the evidence now and, and comparison. But even suppose, I mean, we know this now looking back and, and I'm, I have to say I'm quite surprised. I thought there would be, I mean, they would at least do something but but it seems that that lockdown or not lockdown is statistically there's some quite countries where you know you can it's difficult comparing these things and it's you know you have to really be a statistician but my my point has just been that it is a value judgment at this stage do you want to hide in a corner or do you do you feel that if you, i mean if you live with people that are old perhaps it was a better strategy yes. if you are a student i mean or a hiker or whatever you live in the countryside i don't see the purpose of this stuff and and that's the point I think that we're trying to make here is that you need yeah. to individualize the risk for yourself exactly. and it becomes a value judgment. Exactly. Yes, but we also have statistical evidence. You can compare, yeah. say, Florida, where they, where, they, where they really followed the science, namely the great Barrington the scientist, the governor, the, yeah. the, the listened to them and, 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 and wiped them at advisors since September last year, compared with California. So, And you see that Florida does not fare worse. By full by 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 putting the stages on 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 focus protection of those who are at risk and let the other people live their lives. Mm. So it's important also to have. It's not just a value judgment. I would say, as a, as a philosopher of science, we also have scientific evidence, and we have to look into the scientific evidence and and uh, see what we what we can learn from it. And the scientific evidence that this is statistical evidence that's coming in now suggests that that over i mean if you look at it over a longer period of a couple of months lockdowns are not significant 
they can do well in a very short run. So if you say we make a lockdown for two weeks now and then you see infections can go down if everybody complies, but this does not solve the problem because then the, people don't the comply. virus still is there. No, it's not that people don't comply, but that the idea, I mean, put it that way, the idea of flattening the curve, which was the original idea, does not change anything about the total number of infections and total number of deaths. But, but we forgot that, you know, after the first, after that didn't work, we forgot that. Um, anyway, so I, I, because we, 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 we've actually got a little over time. I've got a last question for you on the philosophy of science or epistemology. Um, why is it important, you know, that we understand it? And, and uh, do you have a good book for us to read on it? Yes, we have to understand, I mean, we have to, uh, the critical reflection on science is important. So we, we philosophers of science, our job, and I'm strictly professional and all what I'm doing here is to, to look at knowledge claims. Whoever makes these knowledge claims, are they justified? What's the foundation for these uh, knowledge claims? And philosophers have been critical all the time since Socrates, and, and philosophers of science have to be critical uh, in whatever situation, uh, the, what's, what about what's going on in science. And we learn something from this by, by, by critically examining claims to knowledge that, that other people make. We learn either these, these claims come out corroborated or there are doubts and then we should have a debate. And there are a lot, I mean, in the English speaking world, there are a lot of good books out there. I mean, for philosophy interested people, I would, of course, I suggest my, my own ones, which is this last one about science and science and human freedom. So all the argument that we talked about there, I mean, in philosophical terms, uh, it's in there about enlightenment and, and what enlightenment implies for human freedom. And when I wrote this book from 2017 to 2019, of course, I had no idea of, of, of uh, what was coming about and how uh, and, um, that at a certain extent. And what you I had no computer was, model. Yes, yes, no, uh, yeah. Okay, well, Michael or Michelle, I would like to thank you very much for the time you gave me. It's a very interesting conversation, and uh, it's, uh, one of the listeners say you've got a very good sense of humor. So, thank you. Okay, for being thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, we should not lose, we must not lose our sense of humor, although some situations are depressive. Yeah, thank you. Thank